Hello and welcome. I'm David Gibson, director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University, and your host for this webinar, The Quality of Mercy, Justice, Forgiveness, and Public Discourse. We'll be debating repentance and redemption in an era of cancel culture. Now, this event is part of a year-long series of events sponsored by the Provost's Office here at Fordham. It's titled Speech Acts. This series aims to address the constellation of issues that often come under the heading of cancel culture, whatever that is, such an ill-defined thing. But there are issues such as free speech in the workplace, political discourse and polarization, the First Amendment, and of course, academic discourse on campuses. Now, I'll, we're posting a link to the Speech Acts website in the chat box on the side along with the listing of past events and also the two other events that will follow our discussion and will conclude uh, this series in the coming weeks. Now, our discussion is unique in this series in that appropriately for a center dedicated to examining questions related to religion and culture, we wanted to look at the spiritual and religious aspects of what some believe is a new wave of censoriousness and intolerance in American society. Now, to my mind, I wonder if this isn't just one of the issues at stake, but is in fact the issue, the heart of the problem. I wonder, are we witnessing a, a kind of neo-Puritanism that has deep roots in our own United States culture? Can religious traditions point a way toward a solution? Can we recover practices of repentance and forgiveness and redemption that are central to the great spiritual teachings. Joining us today to discuss these issues are three truly distinguished writers and scholars who come from three different religious backgrounds, all with something insightful to add. First, we're delighted to welcome the Reverend Charles Howard, the university chaplain at the University of Pennsylvania, a widely published writer who sees his vocation as working for, quote, a communal increase in joy peace, justice, and love. Amen to that. And next we have Rabbi Danya Rutenberg of the National Council of Jewish Women and an award-winning author. Her latest book to be published in fall 2022. You can see, a, we'll put up a pre-order link also in the, um, in the chat box. Her book um, is really spot on for today's conversation. It's called On Repentance and Repair, Making Amends in an Unapologetic World. And finally, we're joined by Stephen Pope, a professor of theology at Boston College and a popular speaker who teaches and writes regularly on issues of mercy and forgiveness. I've personally followed Steve's work closely for years, and we're really happy to have him here as we're happy to have all of you. So now I'm going to begin by posing some questions to our panelists, but I also want you all, the, the audience, uh, to remind you that you can post questions or comments in the chat box here at the bottom of the chat function at the bottom of this Zoom screen. I will uh, refer to and raise those questions and themes with our panelists as we proceed through the hour. But first, let me start by putting a, a simple question to each of you, and I'll start with uh, Charles Howard. Uh, Chaz, is the United States in an increasingly unforgiving society when it comes to lapses in public or private behavior? Or you know, was it always thus, and are we just more aware of it now? Chaz, what do you say? Well, hello, everybody. It's really good to, to be here with you all. I want to just begin by offering gratitude to our dear friends at Fordham and your wonderful center. And it's a joy to share space even virtually with this wonderful panel. And uh, Rabbi Ruttenberg, your book looks fresh. So, you know, I, I just pre-ordered, so yeah, there, there's, there's plus one. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to reading it and recommend all of y'all on, uh, on the call do the same. You know, it's an interesting question. I, I spent all morning long doing deep research on this very topic, uh, meaning I, I spent about an hour over tea with my 15 year old daughter. I thought what, what better expert than to engage a current teenager uh, who who I was excited to sort of get a little window into her mind. You know, teenagers can sometimes be poker face and, and particularly with their, their parents can sometimes shut it down. 
So I'm, I, I was glad to spend a little time with, uh, with her. And I asked her that very question. And she said two things. She said, with celebrities, I think we are less forgiving. But with my friends, she thinks that people are actually more forgiving and more understanding. And she cited two different examples. I'll just sort of throw something out there for us to, to think about and get us started. She's big on social media and she's kind of my, my mentor and my tutor when it comes to social media. I, I'm, I guess I'm a part of that sort of late MySpace, Facebook generation and she's much more TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and things like that. And she says, she gave me two examples of people who were in her words were TikTok famous. I'd never heard of any of these celebrities, but she, she described their millions and millions of followers, who she named. And she gave two different examples, and I don't mean to sort of uh, equate the two mistakes that they made. One was a, a TikTok person who was, was credibly accused and later confessed to sexually assault uh, a number of people. The second was to another sort of public figure on TikTok who made some racist comments. And she described how their followers canceled them, meaning they literally canceled their subscriptions to their like YouTube pages, that they stopped being their followers. They sort of, you know, unfollowed people in, in the name of making a statement for a couple of things. One was, was we won't tolerate that type of behavior, not on our watch, that's not okay. And we, as people who are, who are a part of your business model, want to sort of make a statement. And her parallel in her mind was similar to like the Montgomery bus boycott. There was a public uh, bad thing that was happening, segregation, a public evil. And people canceled their trans passes, essentially canceled sort of taking the bus there because of what they saw was it was a public terrible thing, made a statement, brought about change. People don't like what these, tic, what these sort of artists on TikTok are doing. They made a statement. They, they wanted to bring about change that way. So they, they, they boycotted these artists there um, in, in what they did. The other reason why she said they do it though, a lack of belief in the authorities to hold people accountable. And, and this was just right. She's like, look at what we see are people who are wealthy and powerful always get off. Courts aren't sort of stopping them. The law is not arresting them. They're always getting off. Therefore, we have to hold people accountable, she says. But when it comes to my friends, I understand why they make the mistakes they make. I know what, that they're going through. You know, I know that person. I know, he's, I know he's not really sexist. I know he's not really homophobic or racist. Like, he's just, he's kind of going through something right now. He has a hard time at home, therefore, like, we'll check him and we'll push him or her, but like it's sort of a different situation and we will allow them to sort of re-enter the, the fold. We will forgive them. She said, it's much harder to forgive a celebrity even after they post the kind of tearful video of, I'm sorry, I've learned a lesson. Please come back. Please don't, don't affect my business. Please don't affect me personally. So like, we, we never forgive that person, never. But I will always forgive my friends. And so to answer your question in, in a long roundabout way, I think in some ways we're actually less forgiving of public figures. But I think we're actually more forgiving of people in our circles because we have a greater understanding of the psychological, I don't know, psychological soil that so much of our behavior emerges from nowadays. I'm not sure either is good or bad, but that's sort of this, the, the expert opinion of a 15 year old um, who sort of poured into to me this morning. Thank you. That's that's actually great. Uh, I have a 16 year old, so uh, you know I get that that kind of wisdom um, is very good. And I want to return to that point of the personal versus the private because I think it's a fascinating one. Uh, Rabbi Danya Rutenberg, let's uh, turn to you. So, oh, so so much um, in that, and I that um, talking about comparing cancellation to the bus boycott is is so powerful. <laughs> I'm going to take that with me. And I think, I mean, I think there is really something there to the dimension of public versus private, the calling in versus calling out is, is the, the language used in the contemporary discourse. Um, and that's about power, right? That's about whether or not you're in community with someone and are part of the bonds of ongoing relationship. And are, if you're in a community, then a, there is a, a, an implicit internal 
accountability, right? If you're my friend and I call you in, I say, ouch, right? What you did hurt uh, and you, your behavior doesn't change that will affect the relationship eventually. But if someone has power out there, um, then uh, my uh, ability to, um, to uh, address it, particularly when we think about when you actually apply a power analysis and it's, you think about, uh, I mean, the reason social media is um, so surprising to so many people, it is owned by, you know, American oligarchs basically, but um, radically democratized uh, the public sphere. People who had not had a voice in public discourse for so long now have an ability to weigh in on the behavior of public figures or others with great power. So particularly when you look at um, those with significant money, significant amounts of power, particularly when you look across lines of um, gender, race, other lines of power difference. Um, this is the mechanism for saying, for, for calling people to accountability. And if people don't respond to that call for accountability, then saying, you know, no, thank you. I mean, there are people who, who respond to a call for accountability meaningfully and their fans uh, respond also, but the people who double down and say, actually, I'm going to continue being transphobic and, co and counting my dollars. Um, you know, people can make a choice about how they how they engage with that. Um, but I do want to, in all of this, radically reframe the question. Because are people being unforgiving, I really believe is the wrong question, which is why I wrote a book. Um, <laughs> our country and culture so much starts with the forgiveness question. And we're not asking, what do we ask of those who perpetrate harm? What are the things, if you cause harm, what should we as individuals on the you know individual relationship level with you and your friends, with your spouse in your workplace, or on the institutional level, or in public, in the public square, when it's a celebrity or a viral video, or on social media, or on the national level, when harm is caused, what are the reasonable expectations of the harm doer vis-a-vis -vis cleaning up their mess, right? We all make mistakes, right? We all cause harm. Sometimes people cause harm quite intentionally as we can just open up the news and see myriad examples and cry every day. <laughs> I've been crying a lot lately. Um, <laughs> my work with International Council of Jewish Women right now is building up the system so that when uh, abortion access is uh, destroyed for half the country, we have some systems in place to try to care for people in some way. Like, <laughs> you know, there's so much harm happening now. And so the question is, if somebody causes harm, what is a reasonable expectation? What is the path forward? If I screwed up unintentionally, how do I fix it? Which is why I turned to Maimonides, who is a 12th century Jewish philosopher, sage, physician, um, uh, uh, commentator on Jewish law, and he takes some wisdom from the Talmud and other places in, in Jewish sources uh, previously and sort of codifies them into the laws of repentance and lays out five steps of, you know, here is how you do the work of repentance. And so I think before we're talking about like, we should forgive people, it's like, well, why? If you're still, if you broke my foot because you weren't paying attention, then I wanna know what you're doing to pay my medical bills. I wanna know that you're not gonna do it again. If you're, cause you weren't paying attention cause you were staring at your phone, cause you were drunk again and you need to look at that cause you don't care that there are people in the way cause you're so self-involved. Like, why am I forgiving you? I'm sitting here in pain, fix it. 
right? And so what are the things we can say before we can talk about, before forgiveness even comes up, let's talk about the expectations on you to, to do some cleanup work. Okay. Listen, let me flip it over to uh, Steve Pope uh, real quickly as well. Steve, what do you see as the, um, the, 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 the state of American society in these things? Worse, better, the same? The big question. And um, I think to answer it, it's too, uh, in many ways, it's an empirical claim that historians would have to look at how did we function during the Vietnam War, which when I was a teenager, there was a lot of hostility, outgroup, anger, uh, recriminations, a suspicion. Um, so I, what I do see as a moral theologian and with the limitations that that focus brings, I do think that um, sociologists have told us a lot about how we're more and more isolated, both isolated in terms of our, ourselves as individuals, and not just before, not just COVID, but our society is more and more stripping away civil institutions and intermediate associations that leave us isolated. And number two, isolation within our groups, our in-groups, the affiliation groups um, that is aggravated and really ramped up a lot by social media and cable news and uh, talk radio and so forth. So isolation, I think, tends to lead to number two, low empathy across groups. Um, the chaplain's discussion about his daughter was a good example. You can relate to people in your group, even if they're annoying, you can have the framework for talking about them and you have things in common that help to bridge the gap of misunderstanding or offenses. Um, but as, as our ability to empathize with people from other groups um, is reduced, I think that raises, thirdly, anxiety and fear. And anxiety, fear, it's kind of a trifecta, anxiety, fear, and mistrust. And of course, um, the third point is really important because the mistrust is now at historic highs for since the 20th century, historic highs for our political institutions, for government, uh, but also mistrust for outgroups and their members. And so that we now have people that are not just different, but there are opponents and opponents aren't just people that have different points of view and different interests, but there are enemies. And that, um, that all aggravates the problem of fear, which leads to fourth, I think our uh, you know, worry that probably is the basis for thinking about this um, discussion is the uh, lack of civility in our public spaces, lack of uh, public discourse that is tolerant and seeking understanding, um, that people more or less uh, are afraid of public spaces as being a place of offense and being offended, giving offense and being offended. And I think that is what leads to then anger. This is the fourth, the fifth point I want to make is that anger is in this bigger, much bigger context uh, that in which anger is not only um, directed to what we fear, but also generates aggression. Um, aggression that often acts in a scapegoating way to build solidarity within your group by identifying enemies outside your group. And that means that um, the more you can hate the other, the more your in-group solidarity is enhanced. So where does that leave us about for, with forgiveness and mercy? in a bad way. And um, I agree with the rabbi that um, forgiveness is not a silver bullet. It's not a fix all. It's not the solution, the panacea to all of this. I do think one of the problems we have when it comes to forgiveness is we don't have a clear consensus about what it means. Um, and that we could talk about that more because uh, I know my time is short here. I would say basically uh, my understanding of forgiveness, and I do appreciate my Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas um, his rough contemporary, that forgiveness is best understood as the, uh, a commitment to goodwill toward one's wrongdoers. The debate is whether that goodwill should be conditioned on some performance that the wrongdoer has to um, enact, or is that goodwill toward wrongdoers unilateral? Um, if it's unilateral, it can still require the justice that is involved in accountability and it can still require accountability from the wrongdoer. Last point I wanna make about this though, is one of the problems of this, this uh, framework is that often we think of the wrongdoer as the other person and not as ourselves. 
it becomes the big, there's a big danger of self-righteousness. And this is endemic to in-group um, moral focus. So what we, I think, really need now is for religious institutions um, and our moral authorities to talk about two big values. One is the importance of trying to understand how other people think when they don't share my framework, my presuppositions, my assumptions, maybe even in some of my core values. So curiosity is key. And I think secondly is humility, the willingness to see that we're, we have our blind spots, we have our frailties, we've made mistakes, and that we shouldn't be standing in judgment of other people, but rather in a, in a, in a basic stance of human solidarity that we share a common dignity, but also common moral weaknesses. That's uh, very powerful. Thank you all three of you for setting this, this discussion up so well. And it's already raised uh, questions. I thought I'd thought about everything before this, but I mean, that, the whole uh, concept of, of power and public and personal. Um, one basic thing, which I kind of want to toss out to you, which, which has been raised with this, seems to me is also, uh, you know, apropos of what you said, uh, Rabbi, you know, that who, but who determines the harm? That also seems like a question of power. I mean, some people would say, you know, Colin Kaepernick uh, kneeling at the national anthem did committed some terrible thing, and he needs to apologize, et cetera. You know, I would say that's absurd, but um, that's me. You know, part of forgiveness or, or part of this whole reconciliation, repentance sort of thing, is who determines what is harm, and is that just a question of power, or is there some way that we can as a society, make that kind of objective determination. Chaz, what do you think about that? An important question, man. It really is. In the end, I think uh, for those of us who aren't involved in the kind of exchange of uh, injury and offense and potential forgiveness or lack of forgiveness, those on the sideline of those things, it, it deeply affects how we judge and how we sort of view it. So for someone who, to use a contemporary example, for someone who is not a, a police officer, who doesn't have a police officer in their family, for someone who is not of African descent, as we watch the kind of deep wrestling with contemporary policing and the response to violence against black bodies, there are those of us who, who sort of see, hey, look, you know, what, well, what's happening to black people being pulled over? I've been pulled over too, it's not that bad. And but your protests, they're, they're too much. You're burning down cities, you're tearing up your own neighborhoods and then like the kind of judging of the response to this, of it's not that bad, police do a good job, it's a small percentage, it, you know, like all the way we sort of explain away that it's not that big a deal. To, the black, to a black man who's been stopped in every single city I've lived in multiple times, never for doing anything against the law, it feels deeply injurious. It feels deeply painful. And so you're right, there's, there's a sort of, there's, there's a missing of what's going on. And if you add to that all that, that Dr. Pope was sort of saying too around um, kind of echo chambers and, and, and lack of, like all of that, it, it, makes it, it makes it hard. So to me, I, I, what I would say is, hey, look, like I understand your perspective. You have a cousin who is a police officer. Your experience with police officers is very different. As one person who's been injured, by this, I see this particular issue differently. I'll just sort of just juxtapose it with another issue. During the hearings for um, Chief Justice Kavanaugh, I believe, when so there was sort of so much conversation around violence against women, that hit my wife very differently than it hit me. I think I understood her perspective. I think I agreed with her politically, but I recognize this as someone who has been sort of harassed someone who has experienced sort of violence against a woman's body and in a way that I hadn't I sort of saw that exchange in a slightly different way than she did I'm not sure I, I, I can sort of hold my perspective as stronger better anything at all like that because I'm not involved in that exchange I am involved as I'm a human being and my heart breaks when there's violence against any other human being I think you factor in sort of you know, social media and the news and all those things and politics that makes each case unique. But to kind of fully go back to the, to the question though, it's hard when you're not involved in it directly. 
It's really tough when you're not involved in it um, directly. I think that, that that brings up what, what Steve was talking about, that humility, uh, which some of our posters as well put in there is a, is a central part. Also getting in, e even those of us, again, the self-righteousness is always the problem. We're, you know, we're doing the right thing. The other person is all bad, but getting into the other person's, you know, the uh, uh, shoes, whether it's a, a woman or a, a person of color or whatever is, is a way of, you know, determining the harm or understanding the harm, it, it seems uh, better. Um, Rabbi Ruttenberg, um, so what is, to, to pick up on your question though, and it, was, it seemed like an interesting also a potential differentiation with Steve Pope and where he's coming from. But so how is, what, what must we demand of to, to, in order to confer forgiveness, if that's what, in order to forgive? What must we ask of the person who has done harm? What must they do? So Maimonides lays out five steps of repentance functionally. If you I've spent a lot of time deep in uh, his laws of repentance, and um, really there are five steps. Um, the first one is, and this is an interpersonal harm, um, uh, or for interpersonal, yeah, in, in cases of interpersonal harm. Uh, the first one is confession, a, a full and complete without qualifications, accounting of the harm caused. This is not an apology. It is owning what you did. Uh, and Maimonides says it is ideally public. Um, I don't think every case warrants that. Um, if I screwed up in my marriage, I'm not gonna be posting that on Twitter, right? That's not the place to really truly own that, but Certainly there are times and places where a more public dimension is appropriate, definitely uh, proportionate to the harm. If you said something racist in a staff meeting, then you need to go back and own that in the staff meeting or post it on the, the team Slack or whatever to really say, and not just, um, you know, to, to really like, I did, you know, talk, like really like go into it, like without, I didn't intend, I didn't mean, I thought, you know, here's my, here's, like, here's the story of my feelings, like really focus on the impact. What was the thing? Why was it racist? What was the problem? You know, to really fully own what the thing was and what it did, right? Step one, confession, own it. Um, and that in itself is really hard because you have to already, that story we have about ourselves as the hero is already like we're already walking away from that story and it's hard and it's painful and there is loss and challenge. This is a whole identity voyage that has to happen. And that first step is already really difficult. Um, step two is trying to, is starting to change. It's not a one-time thing. Um, it may involve education. It may involve therapy, it may involve rehab, it may involve um, making changes to one's life, it may involve deleting apps, it may involve, I, you know, it's like, who knows, right? But, um, it, it, but starting to, to, to make actual concrete changes to one's life so that one can begin to become the kind of person that does not do the thing anymore. Right. Um, if I am not paying attention to my spouse because I'm looking at my phone all the time, then I need to come up with a new system. Right. If I am um, continually as a nation perpetrating systemic racism, right, first I need to acknowledge that I have done that or else it's going to be in, right. Because if you don't do, if you don't acknowledge it and then make changes, you keep doing the thing, right? Enslavement, to lynching, to uh, redlining, to mass incarceration, right? To voter suppression, right? You keep, it's the same sin repeated again and again and again. Um, you'll find a way back if you don't make changes. And so what are the things you can do to start becoming different? Then you get to amends, 
right? Which is what is owed the person who was harmed, the victim, victims. Uh, what does that look like? Is it monetary? Is it you're now, you don't have money, but you can now, you, it, the appropriate thing is I'm going to spend the rest of my life being uh, an advocate for um, changing sexual assault policy, right? Uh, the person that I harmed never wants to talk to me again. And it is inappropriate for me to be running up and apologizing to them, but I'm gonna spend the rest of my life trying to, you know, like my amends is gonna be a lifelong effort, right? Or is it, um, I, you know, you can come up, I can come up with a million different possible amends, but there's amends. And um, then apology, and the apology is not to get off the hook. It is not written by your publicist, right? It is not posted on Instagram. It is not, right? The, the confession may be posted on Instagram, um, but the apology flows organically from all of the other work you've been doing. Um, and then step five, the final step, is that when you have the opportunity to do something different and you always will, you make a different choice because you have done the work to become different. Um, Steve Pope, that Maimonides seems to track our, the Catholic confess our sins, do penance and, and amend our life. Uh, the the, the, the three-step uh, uh, sort of Christian um, act of, of contrition, no? Yes, it does. And um, you can unpack it into different differentiations the way the rabbi just did. And that's those really are about repenting. Um, and the question then would be um, two, a couple of questions. Um, is repentance a necessary condition of uh, being forgiven, at least in the sense that I've used it here as a commitment to goodwill to the wrongdoer. And if that's if it's a necessary condition, it means that, that we're warranted to have bad will to the wrongdoer until such time that the wrongdoer repents. But in fact, a lot of times in ordinary life, we do forgive people. We stop, I'm, we're not talking about horrible crimes, but insults and offenses and, and, and small scale um, kind of harms. We do forgive people unilaterally without expecting a process of repentance. So it might be that that is especially helpful when the crime, the, the, what's been done, criminal or otherwise, has been so grave as to require a really deliberate long process of introspection and, and self-reform. Um, but so one question would be whether repentance is a necessary condition for grant of the victim to grant forgiveness. The second would be whether um, repentance is a necessary condition for the wrongdoer to appropriate that forgiveness or goodwill. And I think there it has to be, which is to say that uh, if, if, think, if you put this in, in the language of love, you can say, I love the wrongdoer, but they're never going to be able to appropriate that, benefit from it, unless they realize they need to be loved in this way, in a forgiving way. And so, um, this introduces the distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation, which I think is also important in moral theology, that reconciliation is the reestablishment or the rebonding of a, a friendship that had been for some, in some way riven by wrongdoing. And then you need to have an interpersonal a communication that involves both the, communi the communication of a desire to acknowledge the wrongdoing to make amends, to repent, to change the way of life, which is what repentance essentially means. Um, and also the communication of forgiveness by the victim who has now accepted the stance and narrative of the wrongdoer and the commitment of the wrongdoer not to repeat um, what they've done in the past. So I think in many ways, the Jewish and the Christian conception of this is, is very, uh, not surprisingly, very similar. Um, I do think there's a, a key distinction in Catholic moral theology between um, forgiveness that is permissible, that is required, and that is heroic or supererogatory. Because some forms of uh, some forms of forgiveness, uh, especially the 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 the, um, the steps that Maimonides uses, puts the obligation on the victim after they've been uh, 
the uh, the recipient of repeatedly of uh, of entreaties to forgive, um, the victim is required to forgive, and if they don't, they're now blameworthy. Uh, at least that's my understanding. I, I could be wrong. I'm open to correction. But in the Catholic tradition, there's not so much stress on the requirement there, but that you're permitted to forgive sometimes, but you're not required to, such that if you don't forgive, you're you're not to be blamed because it's the pain is understood to be so hard. Um, that it, it may be something that you can't overcome. Uh, but there, uh, then we also have the examples of nickel mines and so forth, which is heroic forgiveness. I think the core uh, issue, just one more thing, David. Sure, yeah, yeah. The core commitment, um, the core question is whether we are obligated to have goodwill to every person, regardless of what they've done to us. And I think for the Christian ethic of agape, the answer has to be yes. Rabbi, why don't you jump in? So. Uh, number one, in Judaism, uh, the harmdoer can do all of the work of forgiveness, or of repentance, of tshuva. Uh, we call it tshuva returning back to the person you were supposed to be, get back on that path. Um, you, you, you can do all of the repentance work at all the steps and never be forgiven. You are not sitting around waiting, dependent on uh, the victim's forgiveness at any point. You can get, you can do all of your work, get right with God, um, even if you are never forgiven. That's number one. So when, if you cause harm, you keep your eyes on your own blue book and you do your work. Um, and the weaponize, weaponization of forgiveness, why won't you forgive me? You need to forgive me. Like the, you can't, you know, like it's not, you can't. It happens in the Jewish community, but the, theoretically it should not. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, there is zero, 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 zero obligation of the person who is harmed to forgive the harm doer at all remotely if they have not done all of their homework, right? All of the, I've just described all of these steps. If they haven't done that, it's nothing. Like we're not talking, victim can, can feel whatever they want to feel and be wherever they are in whatever place of rage and pain and trauma and experience that they need to be, um, that's okay. Um, so, you know, a, a perpetrator who's, who's not, who hasn't done real chuva or God forbid is still con committing the harm, we don't want to talk about forgiveness at all. Um, so that's number two. Number three, um, there is this line on Maimonides, if the, the uh, perp asks, uh, the perpetrator asks for forgiveness three times, and if not, the sin is on them. I have a whole thing in my book. I don't want to take all of our time giving my whole extended dance remix on it, but the sin is the next paragraph in, in the laws of repentance, um, which is to be not unforgiving, is to be not petty. And it seems to be that that's for basic things that, you know, would, like, it's not, and Maimonides didn't assume that we're talking about trauma. Maimonides took so for granted that, like, obviously, we're not talking about irreparable harm. Um, that these are things that, you know, Maimonides doesn't think that it is good for a person, um, a person's own personal thing that they're holding. If, if somebody's coming to them sincerely, repeatedly, having been doing the work in a meaningful way, and that person is still clenching, that it's not good for them to be still holding on like that. Um, but we're not talking about somebody who's suffered significant uh, life-altering trauma. That's not the level of harm that's being discussed there um, is, is where I wanna leave that. And now I've taken up a lot of space and so I'm going to withdraw a little bit and pass the mic. No, no, I, that's a great point. And I, this is a fascinating debate. What is brought up and, 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 and Steve, you raised the nickel mines, um, uh, Lancaster County 2006 shooting school, shooting at Amish school. Again, I, I was a journalist for that. I was gonna also bring up the, uh, covering that. And I was also gonna bring up the uh, 2016 Mother Emanuel Church shooting in, in Charleston. Horrific massacres. 
um, in the in the first one, the the the, the shooter of the of the the girls, the Amish girls, killed himself. And the other one, Dylan Roof, white supremacist, never asked forgiveness that the, 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 you know, and yet he was forgiven. The Amish parents were for, you know, it, it was a stunning outpour. It was a stunning reaction from people that these parents, that these churchgoers would offer forgiveness for people who couldn't or wouldn't ask for it. Chaz, I mean, is this even a useful, is this so out of the realm of our common everyday ordinary experience? Uh, is it just uh, that kind of, well, what, what Steve mentioned, that kind of heroic forgiveness? Is it, does that really, does that offer us a useful lesson? They are tremendous examples of radical love in the face of hate that I think are, are timeless and will always be powerful examples of, of ways that people can super heroically respond to the unimaginable. And I think a range of our religious traditions call us to our better selves and to, to love like that. I, I, there was a comment in, in, the, in the chat though that I think really uh, points to why this is a hard conversation. Because I think that there's sort of like three or four different levels that we need that we're considering around forgiveness, canceling, restoration, and you know, and and injustice. And I mean, I think that there's this something has happened to me personally. You, I don't mean to say this flippantly. You broke into a school and you murdered my child, and I'm challenged to to potentially forgive you. I also want your confession and repentance, and I want sort of justice. And like, I think there's there's one level conversation there. There's another sort of celebrity conversation. Think of Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein. Of, you know, what, what does it mean to cancel them? Meaning we will never watch their movies or films again. If they have shows, like no, we're not working with them, they're canceled and they are being held accountable publicly or not being held accountable publicly. And maybe they will go on a journey of repentance and maybe there's some type of restoration, public person. And then there's these hot button issues that put us in different camps. And I think, you know, Stephen sort of pushed at this a little bit too of, can I forgive somebody who voted differently than me? Should I? Should I cancel Republicans? Should I cancel Democrats? Um, and, and why that I think is such a really hard moment for us as Americans. And this I think transcends the US in a whole lot of ways. And there's reasons for that. I mean, I think the old debate between to use a very present issue, kind of pro-life, pro-choice, has now turned into a, a debate around like you hate women, you do, you you are anti women's rights, whereas you hate babies, and how can I engage with you on the other side of this issue when you are dehumanizing me or dehumanizing, dehumanizing others? Therefore, like I, I can't engage you, I, I don't want to engage you, I don't want to forgive you because you're the worst, or you voted for someone who I see as a bigot. Or you're voting for a side that hates America and wants to take away everybody, like the sort of hyperbole and sort of pushing up. That's really different than forgiving a, a, an individual figure who's done something personally. And in a lot of ways, I think this is one of our, our, our callings of the moment. But the example you use around a stunning forgiveness of, of a racist shooter who goes in and kills people in a prayer service. Maybe there is a lesson in that for all of us when it comes to a radical grace that we can show the other. And again, I'll end by saying, I think me even using that example is a part of the danger of the moment. Equating a, 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 a domestic terrorist with someone who voted differently than me as, 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 a, as a parallel for forgiveness is a part of the danger of the moment, I think. Yeah. There's a, a, another uh, aspect which, which is kind of raised, which is, um, what about those who do do ask forgiveness? Is it um, you know how do we determine if it's legit? I was uh, put in mind of a, a, a fascinating. I'll put a link to it. A, a piece in the New York Times the, the other day by Jessica Bennett uh, titled "He's Sorry, She's Sorry, Everybody Is Sorry." Does it matter? I'll put a, a link to it in the chat. Um, and it's uh, she goes on to write just talking about how. Yeah, you know, Whoopi Goldberg was apologizing the other day. Joe Rogan was apologizing the other day. She writes, 
It can feel these days we are swimming in a sea of ostensible contrition, but something strange has happened in the process instead of leaving us feeling healed or as if there is a rightful place for accountability in our world. Um, all this apologizing seems to instead have had a flattening effect. Everyone is sorry, yet at the same time, no one's apology feels like enough. She writes, call it apology atrophy. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good line. And it's a very punchy piece, but I, I you know, there is the, the other side of this where everybody's, they do something and say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, and uh, how do we determine what's legit to Steve Pope? Let's go to you first, you know. Well, I'm the one who has the most in life to be apologetic for. <laughs> so the biggest sinner in the group. So I have experience with this. I, I think we don't know. We, we don't, we, we don't have a window into someone's soul, but there are behavioral observ observable kinds of actions. There are words that we can hear. There are changes in someone's life to, that can show us they really have gotten it. And it has to be practical and concrete. It can't just be sentiment. And that's one of the things that um, discredits real apology is fake apology. Um, I think when you go back, if I can, I, I'm really intrigued by the, um, this issue of, of heroic forgiveness and it is such a Rorschach test because for many people, what happened in Charleston and, and Nickel Mines is kind of Christianity at its worst. These people being stupid and just forgiving because Jesus told them to forgive and not thinking through the consequences of it. Um, and th this is the uh, this is some of the public outrage about the lack of outrage by the relatives of the victims in those two sh terrible shootings. Um, I think one of the problems is there's one of the genuine and legitimate concerns is that justice gets sidelined and replaced by forgiveness. And that is a big mistake. But it's understandable if we think of justice as purely retributive, that is retaliatory pain. I'm going, you hurt us, so I'm going to hurt you back. And there's a, there's a visceral, and I think a very elemental human response to wrongdoing, not only in when it's done to us, but when we see it done to other people that think that wrongdoer deserves to be hurt and to be harmed. And that I think in a, in a Christian context anyway, is deeply problematic. Um, that if we are really truly to have love for every neighbor, even the most uh, harmful, the most malicious neighbor, um, the question isn't whether we should, we should uh, love the wrongdoer, it's what should we do about that love? How can it be expressed in a way that's fully compatible with accountability and punishment and protection of society? Um, I think one of the problems, uh, last point on this, is that often when people hear the word forgive, they think it means we're going to essentially condone what happens or that we excuse what happens or we're, we're waiving the penalty to the person who's done wrong. And in forgiveness, in fact, only makes sense if we don't do those things. It has to be fully in relation to what actually happened and recognizing the injustice that was, what's happened. And then to say, how do we enjoin forgiveness and justice rather than say we have to choose one or the other, which is the way our dichotomizing public discourse tends to frame the problem. That's a, a great point, Steve. And uh, let's go to the, you know, the other side of this rather, you know, some false superficial apology or is everybody apologizing and no one meaning it to, you know, uh, uh, and Rabbi, I'll, I'll direct this to you first. The, you know, what if, again, not, let's not pick some horrific, uh, huge crime, but just some small thing, a bad tweet, a dumb thing you say to someone else or on social media. And you do, you apologize, you, there's some act of, of, of penance, of, of making amends, that kind of thing. Um, you know, are we not quick enough to forgive, to recognize that kind of thing? Because I, I will say, I, you know, out there, and especially in the social media world, and in so many places, um, people can honestly, sincerely forgive, you know, again, something that isn't a, um, a capital offense, and yet it's still held against them. Is, is that a problem? So again, this all comes down to, uh, you know, people, people can tell <laughs> if, if when you screw up, you mean it when you're trying to do the cleanup work. I cannot tell you how many times I have messed up on Twitter because I spent a lot of time there and I am a work in progress, like all of us, um, maybe more than most of us, I don't know. Um, but I have um, veered out of the bumper cars of my lane 
more than once made jokes that did not land that were you know said something out of a place of ignorance and when i have what i do i am i have thank whoever just pointed out that i messed up because it is a gift right someone who takes the time out of their day to teach me something even if they're not teaching me in the language that is the most soft and sweet and coddling you know even if it's strong very directed language it is still a gift right even if i'm the one being called out it is it is, it is a gift and for people who are getting indignant that somebody's not you know arriving at their door with flowers they they miss that they're get, they're getting educated it's a free education <laughs> you thank the person who is there educating them you delete the tweet you immediately public right the harm has to, the confession has to be commensurate to the harm you immediately name what you did you apologize um or at least own fully, right? And maybe that takes a few tweets and you kind of, what you just learned and it's humbling and blah, And if the apology goes out right away and figure out what an appropriate amends is, which maybe is, so it, in my book, I talk about, you know, somebody that I know is a lovely white man who posted a whole bunch of authors that he wanted to recommend. And somebody pointed out that he had like just recommended a whole bunch of white guys. And he was like, oh, and so like appropriate amends is then like, and here's my new book list, right? It's like, it, it doesn't always have to be, um, you know, a, a whole big drama, um, but being thoughtful about the fact that you are an actor in the world and your words and actions have impact. And if you can harm, you can also heal. If you can put out things that whether or not you meant it, um, caused uh even a small amount of of ouch for somebody then you can do go out of your way to do something good it's not hard but i have to um, say i i love what you say and i agree with that you're you're someone who's coming from a point of view someone who's recognizing they too are a sinner this humility that you've made mistakes and i think it gets to a point uh, i think one of steve's initial points of the self the danger of self-righteousness that we get into and that we don't you know we don't make yeah. mistakes uh, it, can I just add one more thing? Sure, yeah, go. Can I just name the title of this talk is from The Merchant of Venice, mm. which is yeah. an anti-Semitic play written by Shakespeare and wherein it's this speech from Portia who is telling Shylock, the Jew, um, that he needs to stop worrying so much about justice and focus on mercy. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> as a Jew, I'm like, you know, we started out and, and the Christians in the room are like, forgiveness, forgiveness. And I'm like, repentance, right? I, you know, I'm seeing this dynamic play out. And I just want to say, like, it's okay to make room for justice. And to some degree, we can't heal some of the larger harms without justice mm -hmm. and um you know and, and it's okay I mean, to that, and, justice of ourselves and that was i think that that issue of justice was was one of the ideas that you kind of, I kind of want to raise subliminally with that that title because it's also you know it's not just forgive no matter what it's uh, the um Listen, we're heading towards the end of our hour. I wanted to just raise one final point with all of you, which is, you know, I, I love this discussion. I appreciate it. And it's uh, and I intentionally wanted to come at it from this, which I uh, essentially what I think is a spiritual or religious uh, issue, um, whether you're spiritual or religious or not, and and from the framework of these our traditions. But the reality is, um, we're an increasingly secular country in the sense that young people are the the, the nuns and ones are, are the fastest growing religious segment if you will um a is there a problem with not being raised in one of these traditions that has a, a framework a, a structure for repentance forgiveness and all of these things um 
is that is that a problem? And is an increasingly kind of secular world is a, is a problem with that? Would that lead to us becoming less forgiving just because we don't have these traditions in our background? Chaz, could I could I tab you to to talk about that? Sure. No, I mean I think on one hand, clearly there's so much beauty, there's so much utility, not to cheapen um, the role of faith and religion, but there's so much utility in our faith traditions on how to how to live beautiful lives in community and I, I, of course our traditions are about far more than that but there's so much in here around how do you create a, a a healthy loving just society and yet um clearly there are people who do not identify as faith people of faith who are religious nuns who are post-religious who are atheists who are obviously deeply ethical people and indeed deeply loving people and deeply forgiving people. And so I, I, I don't think that the secularization of certain parts of our country or society necessarily point toward a deterioration of, of these wonderful societal traits just because people aren't attending services like they used to. And in a lot of ways, um, I, I, I push back on kind of describing us as like Judeo-Christian society. That's not a great term. But there will always, certainly for several more generations, be echoes of those lessons that these great traditions and other traditions have taught people. Um, so, so I don't have the same sort of fears around um, us compared as a, as a society because they're we're less plugged into to religion. Um, I, you know, I, I see a lot of my students on a campus more and more spiritual and not religious um, people. Uh, Danya, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, the kind of loss of some of that background uh, tradition context, uh, religious tradition context. Listen, I, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I agree definitely that Judaism and Christianity are, are really, really, really different traditions. And Judaism was baked mostly in um, Muslim-dominated uh, countries um, or Zoroastrian. So um, Judeo-Christian isn't 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 quite the, the term. But um, you know, really, it's okay that um, it's okay. And I think things come and go in waves. And when we have um, the forms of these, um, these traditions that will feel animating to the next generations, then, then they will animate. You know, I, I've seen it in, in Judaism, we've had, you know, we sort of like had this wave of like assimilation and everybody went to the suburbs and then there was forms of Judaism that came, became very kind of people who were passive and the rabbis up there and then, and then, and then we've had several rounds of explosions of, you know, kind of lay led grassroots and you know, rounds of creativity and engagement and explosion and excitement and interest in a different way. And I think, um, I think these things are cyclical and um, the wisdom is there and it's deep and there are always people holding the fire and how it manifests and what it looks like will continue growing and changing and that's okay. Thanks. Steve Pope, last, last word to you. You, you teach okay. young people and a lot of these nuns at Boston yeah. College, but um, you know, what do you think about the, having the, the background or roots in a religious tradition uh, or not? I'll make three points. I wish I had three hours. But first, mercy is mercy and compassion are human virtues that people can recognize from our religious traditions and others and secular people. Secondly, uh, religious people, uh, including both Jews and Christians, have no monopoly on being forgiving. Usually culture has a bigger impact on people's behavior than their particular religious tradition. Third point, most importantly, I am worried. <laughs> so I'm not as, as sanguine as the other two speakers in that in, uh, in our traditions, uh, our um, ethic of forgiveness is based upon God's forgiveness of us. Uh, Paul says, forgive one another as God has forgiven you. And um, that gives a universality and depth to love 
which I don't think we can concoct out of market mechanisms or popular culture. So my worry is that, um, is that forgiveness will be seen as a therapeutically valuable option for behavior, but not as a moral obligation that's binding on human beings and, um, and particularly intensely binding on people with religious faith. And I think if the religious faith goes, well, eventually forgiveness gets radically domesticated. Powerfully put, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to end this excellent discussion. Steve Pope, Rabbi Rotenberg, Chaz Howard, thank you very much. I just want to thank you all in the audience as well for joining us and for supporting the Center on Religion and Culture here at, at Fordham. Just to wrap up, I wanna say, uh, remind you to check out our website in the coming days. We'll be posting a recording of this conversation that you can share far and wide. Uh, and follow us on social media for information on coming events. Follow uh, Rabbi Ruttenberg as well. She's got a great uh, Twitter game, despite what she says. Also, be sure and join us in two weeks for our next installment in this Speech Acts series on March 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. It's titled Epistemic Bubbles and Echo Chambers, the Political Impacts of Modern Technology basically how social media is making it worse. That echo chambers issue, I think, came up uh, briefly during our discussion. For now, I'm David Gibson, director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University. Thank you all very much on our panel, and thank you all for being here. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Nice thank to you. meet you all. Take care.